Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Ore Valley United Church of Christ. I'm Reverend Drew Tanner, the pastor here. And here we say whoever you are, wherever you are in life's journey, you are a beloved child of God. It is good to see each and every one of you in person this morning. Uh, we are recording this to be posted hopefully later this afternoon. Uh, probably the, the load times are taking a little bit, so uh, for those who end up watching the recording or if, if you run into anybody who asks any questions about the recording, we hope to have it by 7 o'clock this evening. That's probably the earliest we'll be able to get it posted, uh, but it will be for anybody who's able to watch online and wants to participate with us uh, this evening or tomorrow or whenever they're available. So welcome. If you are newer with our community, visiting for the first time or first handful of times, we'd love to connect with you. There's a few ways to do that. If you're on site, we have yellow cards and the seat backs in front of you. You can fill as much information as you'd like, drop those in the offering plate in the middle of our sanctuary here, and we'll reach out to you. Give you a chance to share more about who you are, where you are on life's journey, and give us a chance to answer any questions and share more about our mission. And for you at home, if you're watching online, we have various ways to connect. The easiest ways are by Facebook, or Valley United Church of Christ, send us a message or make a comment, we'd be happy to connect with you. You can also find our email address at orvalleyucc.org and we'll be happy to connect with you via email. <coughs> A few announcements about the life of our church together. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, and every first Sunday of the month we do a food collection drive. We actually have two drives going on right now. So one is for our Interfaith Community Services monthly food collection. We already have an abundance of food growing right there. We collected over 300 pounds last month, so we're hoping to collect a vibrant amount again this month. So if you've got non-perishable goods you'd like to drop off, you can drop them off either today or you can come by. We should have someone in the office on Wednesday and Thursday if you want to drop by then. Uh, but also next Sunday, you're more than welcome to bring them to worship or shortly after worship and we'll be happy to collect those and get them to the food bank at ICS. We're also collecting school supplies for youth on their own. We have an abundance. We already have at least four backpacks and a collection of good school supplies. So if you're able to, we do have a school supply list. We can get you if you don't have access to it. If you're on our email, you should be getting uh, you should be getting the school supply list via email. Otherwise, you can reach out to our office and we'll be happy to let you know or answer any questions you have about that. And now we have a special announcement from Sally. Um, not next Sunday, but the next one, September 11th. We're gonna try to have, going to have, a kickoff Sunday, get the, get the fall season started. I know it's early, everyone isn't back yet, but we'll do, those of you who are. So we're going to have an old, old fashioned potluck. So um, we'll furnish some chicken, and you bring the sides, some salads, some hot dishes, rolls, chips, whatever, desserts, and we'll have an old fashioned potluck lunch after church on the 11th. So try to get everybody to come. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Yeah, if you have any questions about that, please do ask Sally. But well, yeah, we're bringing back Fellowship Hour, and we're bringing it back with a bang with a chicken uh, potluck. So please be able to, if you're able to, bring a side dish. We'd be deeply grateful. If you're interested in helping in any way, shape, or form, you can also talk to Sally, and she'd be happy to let you know how you can help. <laughs> Those are the announcements I have this morning. Are there any other community announcements uh, today? If there are no other announcements for the morning, I invite us to take a deep breath. And filled with the Holy Spirit, let us stand as you are able to body your spirit and just greet your neighbor with a sign of Christ in peace. Yes. 
Please remain standing as you're able and by your spirit and join together as we sing our call to worship.
join me in the unison prayer of transformation and restoration? God, sometimes we say, I'm too busy to an invitation to kindness, friendship, or activism, or pretend to be too busy and avoid being together, bidding, or rubbing elbows with those who make me Sometimes we accept an invitation to be falling on love, so celebrate someone, or just have coffee, but back out for a no show. Forgive us when we state your heart is Sometimes we are the perfect guests, wanting to be the center of attention, and other times we insist on always being close, there, one in control, receiver of praise and gratefulness. Forgive us when we fail in gratitude or generosity. Amen. Dear siblings, to these words of God, first and everlasting assurance of pardon. God loves, invites, nudges, embraces us, and all our resistance is simply hold the balloon of joy and clap at the candles with others' candles. We are forgiven. A plate, a plate is set for us. Amen. Good morning. Today's responsive reading comes from Psalms inspired by Susan Blaine. The ancient psalmist delights in the holy. Optimism feeds in Psalms 112. A joyful presence, knowing God's presence, evidence all around, or justice and power and mercy. Even riches in the midst of unspecified bad news. The wicked are out there, unidentified avatars of evil, routed by the faithful lovers of God. How joyful the ancient psalmist, focused on the holy, and seeing results in a better universe. The modern day prayer of Psalm struggles, doubting easy optimism in the presence of new cycles, bad news, suspect news, new spun into self sustaining untruths, and the wicked are emboldened shapeshifters that exhaust the faithful and rout them into confusion. How cynical the modern day prayer of Psalms, weary doubting and longing for a holy bliss. O oh God, that is all we need, a holy bliss, a spark in the shadow of a confusion, of a beacon to lead beyond optimism and into the depths of hope. Day to day hope, open ended. Not depending on seeing results, but finding strength in each moment. Mercy and justice leading to peace. Experience and wisdom leading to inclusion. Oh, oh Holy One, let fear be crowded and love prevail in your joyful strategy of abundant life for all.
now turn to a time of prayer. And it's time to lift up the prayers of our community and of our world. I want to lift up a prayer. I know that most of our schools have started back, and so I'd like to just lift up a prayer for all of our students, uh, whatever age that they are filled with the Holy Spirit, that they have what they need, and especially blessings upon all of our school supplies that we're collecting, and may they, those go into the hands of eager, willing students who just need a little helping hand to thrive in God's blessings, and may this year be a fruitful one for all of our students everywhere. I also lift up prayers for uh, Ukraine and the war going on there, prayers for all the refugees, the millions of people who have been displaced, and they find shelter in God's care and love, especially those who wind up in our own backyard. Prayers for the Ukrainian leaders and all the Ukrainians who have remained behind to defend and to maintain their homeland. May they have the continued strength, courage, and support they need. Prayers for all of our world leaders, that they have the wisdom, compassion, and fortitude to continue to confront this grave injustice. And prayers upon especially the Russian leaders who are, who are the reason this is happening. May their hearts be broken open, filled with mercy, and bring this injustice to an end immediately. Prayers especially in light of uh, this past week, we heard of a car bombing in Russia and realized that the war is expanding beyond simply one location, as war too often does, starting to take whoever it wants to in its path. So may peace and justice come swiftly. Those are the prayers I have to offer this morning. Are there other prayers to be lifted up from our community? If there are no other prayers at this time, let's go to God in a moment of silence, lifting up the prayers we've heard, as well as the prayers in the sacredness of our heart. Dear God, the one who is peace, healing, and love, we come to you this day in a season of change, in a season of moving from the sunshine and the heat of summer back into the school schedule, back into a time when so many of your children embark on a new journey, on a new chapter, seeking to grow and to blossom in your love, seeking one of the most cherished gifts you've ever given, your wisdom. God, we pray for all of our students, whatever age, we pray that they have what they need to thrive. Prayers for all their families and for us as a community, may we provide support to them in prayer and school supplies and in whatever way we can so that we may participate and that a holy and sacred journey toward your wisdom, and most importantly, towards a closer connection with you. God, especially this season, this monsoon season for us in Southern Arizona, as your abundance flows from the skies, and we sing in joy, and we wait anticipantly for the new rains and for more abundance. God, we joyfully come to you to be prepared to live in the presence of your Holy Spirit so we may follow you, loving and supporting one another. We lift up these prayers and the prayers in our hearts, singing the words Jesus taught us. Yes.
open ourselves in prayer, we now go to celebrate the gifts God pours out into us, into our lives abundantly, and how we are empowered to share those gifts with the world. We enter into our time of offering, celebrating all the gifts of time, talent, and financial resources we've been able to share with this community and with God's people. In this time, if you do have a donation you'd like to share, if you're on site here this morning, we have an offering basket in the middle of the church. During the offertory, you're more welcome to go back there and place any donations. You can also do that at the end of service, whatever you feel called to do. And if you're online with us, you can go to orvalleyucc.org and you can click the My Offering button and you'll be a few clicks away. Or you can mail in any donation to 1401 East Elkhorn, Keystone Way, Or Valley, Arizona, 85704. Whatever gifts you have come to share this morning, whatever gifts you have found in the abundance of God, let us lift them up to celebrate the love that empowers us all. Join me in our invitation to the offering. We are invited to offer our resources, our time, our abilities, our compassion on days when our lives are full and days when our lives feel empty. We are invited to offer what we have and accept what we need. Our prayerful offering is a profound yes to the invitation of God.
Our scripture readings today come from Sorachah 10, 12 through 18, and Proverbs 25, 6 through 7. Sorachah. Pride begins with our stubbornness in a turning of our hearts from our Creator. It begins through people's sin and runs the course into their utter depravity. God's response is to send new and crushing afflictions to bring on their complete ruination. Yahweh brings down arrogant leaders and establishes humble people in their place. God plucks up the arrogant by their roots and puts the lowly in their place. God cuts down their tree, leaving only a stump, then digs out the stump, roots and all. God sweeps away every trace that they ever lived and erases their memory from the earth. Pride was not a part of the Maker's plan for humankind, nor mourning rage for those born of woman. Proverbs 25. Don't try to act grand in the presence of the powerful or grab the place of honor at the table. It's better to be told, come sit up here than to be put down in front of someone important. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be Please pray with me. Dear God, the one who is truth, the one whose word makes us new. God, we humbly gather here this morning seeking to be refreshed in your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. For our young, young ones and young at heart, I wanted to offer a word to maybe focus on during this reflection, and that word is humility. And it's the opposite to say scripture passages. Say scripture passages are about pride. And so I'm going to lead us a little bit more into, well, we're not prideful. What are the scriptures really asking for us? That's humility. Uh, this morning, as I was getting ready, Nolan asked a really good question. Nolan asked, so it's like humiliation. But no, I'm grateful to Howard Thurman, who writes about the drastic difference between humility and humiliation. Humiliation is something that happens to you. It's an embarrassing thing. It's being pushed down. It's being neglected. It's being dehumanized. That's humiliation. It happens to you. Humility is an autonomous choice. It's the choice to give of self. It's the choice to open up oneself to receive. And especially, especially in the second passage we heard today from the book of Proverbs, that's the idea. Don't be grand. Don't be boastful. It is better to wait and to be called. It is better to open oneself up and wait to receive that humility. I think these are incredibly important ideas and passages for our day and time. Because for me, I think humility is the is essential to embark on a path of justice, the justice that brings forth peace, so a justice that includes mercy and moves us towards true peace, not a not a ceasefire where we disagree to disagree. That's not really peace. <clears throat> really, truly, genuinely peace. And ultimately, with that justice and, those, and that idea of peace, that true life of peace, discovering unity. And a couple of things to think about. This is not a sermon series in the traditional sense. I will say that last week's sermon about who it is we keep at bay from Sabbath, or how a Christian church has struggled to really be inclusive on the Sabbath. And today's sermon on humility, and hopefully next week's, and leading on into September 11th, 
is looking to that. I've been looking very excited, very joyfully to our friends of fellowship hours are coming. And today was the day I found out it was a problem. Maybe I can see that. But I'm very excited that it's a problem. Good. I'm very excited about this day. I'm also aware that it's happening on a very historic day for our country and for us as a community. That it's happening on the anniversary, the 21st anniversary of September 11th. And I think there's a lot of important things to reflect on, especially in light of the fact that now both the wars that were born out of September 11th, the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, have both come to a conclusion. That's a lot. And so we're, I'm, I invite you to join me. If you need to, you can go back and watch last week's sermon and try to tie. I'll let you do it. It's going to be a create your own sermon. Uh, but you can maybe see how the threads unfold over these four weeks in preparation for this glorious day in which we both gather on a significant day in history and on a significant day for our church as we come back together to break bread with one another and to drink coffee with one another. Coffee and you. Many people don't, uh, I think it's easy to overlook the importance of the name of the denomination we are a part of. I have a lot of fun when people ask me, oh, you're a pastor. Where are you a pastor at? Well, I'm a part of a small church called Lord Valley United Church of Christ, and we're a part of a denomination called the United Church of Christ. Oh, is that non-denominational? I just said we're part of a denomination. <laughs> Another thing is we often, and this, there's nothing wrong with here, you know, names are confusing. Especially names you've never heard before. But easily people go, I went to a Church of Christ church in Texas. It's like, well, that's great, awesome, wonderful. I appreciate the Church of Christ. They are siblings in Christ with us. They are on the same journey with us. We are not part of the same community. That's important just today. For various reasons. The uniting, the united part of our name is of the utmost importance. And, like any other identity, it begins with story. And this is an unofficial story, which is the best kind of stories, right? The grapevine story says the ones that really live for you long. You hear it through the textbook. But then you get that rumor? Yeah, that's real juice. And so here's the rumor of how the United Church of Christ started. The rumor is it began with some clergy getting together on a regular basis over coffee in St. Louis. We don't have anybody from St. Louis, do we? Nobody from Missouri. Yeah, go get somebody from Missouri. That's how it started. And that's, I like that story. I love that story. I love this idea of clergy just meeting on a regular basis and all of a sudden one day realizing, wait a second. Why are we working together? Why are we pooling our resources? Why are we, why are we doing this? Why are we so separate? And that, that humility, you begin to think about the humility you have over a cup of coffee, or I know some of you, uh, for any of our golfers out there, I know we have some tennis players as well, uh, there's knitters, there's all kinds of little gatherings you have, the humility, the unspoken, maybe even the unconscious humility you have in these gatherings of people in which you recognize, at least on some level, how radically different they are. How if it wasn't for the cup of coffee, how if it wasn't for whatever game you were playing or whatever activity you were sharing, you really would have no reason to even talk to one another, let alone begin to recognize the divine humanity of the other. See, the truth is that unfortunately, as powerful as that wonderful, I'm going to just let you know, I'm living fully for the rest of my life in the idea that our church started over a cup of coffee in St. Louis. Okay, I just love that straight too much. I don't care if somebody debunks it. I'm running with that. <laughs> the sad reality is how we got to the need for that cup of coffee. Because too often, and this is what I see now too, is the emphasizing our differences. 
drawing lines in the sand as absolute. It's not as necessarily identity boundary markers just to celebrate the differences that we are all, all unique, but actually saying this side of the line is the right side and that side of the line is the wrong side. Being deep. I, I became profoundly aware in this day and age of this as I was exploring participating in a program with a different branch of Christianity, for the state of mind, I actually have some family connections to this group of Christians, and I just thought, I'm not sure, why would they offer a program? It seems like a good program. Maybe I should join. Maybe I should explore. As I started going through their paperwork, I was deeply disturbed. They had some stuff in there that I probably, I just, you know, they, in order to make clear their stance on marriage, I just didn't necessarily agree with it. And, and I was bothered. And then I, it kept piling on because it got so nitty gritty. This group of Christians insisted that baptism can only be done by immersion. And so on one hand, not only have they challenged my own theology and contemporary actions of ministry and how I believe we as Christians are called, especially as Protestant Christians who don't actually see marriage as a sacrament, I, not only did I disagree with that, they were, and they were calling into question a lot of my loved ones and a lot of my ministry, they also called into question my own baptism. And I just begin to wonder, why? Why are you doing this? What is the function of this? And what really deeply disturbed me was knowing more history pre that serendipitous cup of coffee in St. Louis. Because for 500 years, I, one of my struggles with preparing this reflection was trying to pick which violent, bloodthirsty conflict over the last thousand years between Christians to talk about this man. I could have chosen the Seven Years' War. I could have told you a story about early on in the Protestant Reformation when there was an attempt to try to bury the hatchet, try to figure out what's going on here. Let's, let's get together. Let's get together. Let's you send a contingency. We'll send a contingency. Let's talk to each other. They meet in Prague, some supposedly a neutral site. The meeting ends with one of the groups of delegates thrown out of a window onto a pile of manure. Because <laughs> that's how we are used to dealing with differences. The Seven Years' War was one of the latest wars in European history, and it's all about Christian difference. But on the amounts of persecutions that happened in England, and Scotland, and throughout mainland Europe for centuries. And we're not talking about chasing non-Christians. That also happened, as we all know in the Inquisition. It also happened to other Christians. That's why the separatists left England. But as soon as the separatists landed in Massachusetts, the Baptists had to run away to Rhode Island. <laughs> and the Quakers had to run away to Pennsylvania because the separatists who were seeking religious tolerance were so religiously tolerant. And there's a reason in the late, in the mid, excuse me, in the mid 19th century, when there was literally nothing west of the Rockies except indigenous people in the ancient indigenous ways, the Mormons wound up in Utah. It all came to a head during the 20th century. While there was this ratcheting up over hundreds and hundreds of years of baptism has to be done this way, Communion can only be done that way. You have to pray this way. You have to sing this way. Music is a great divider in the church. In fact, actually, not just music. 
I read about five or six years ago. I didn't even want to read it. Um, I read the top 10 things that cause church conflict. There's some real irony here. Do you know what the number one thing on that list was? Music. Music. You thought music. Yeah, you could guess. Uh, music is a, is a, a top issue. All right. The type of coffee served at Fellowship Up. What brought it all to a head? What created the context for a theoretical cup of coffee in St. Louis to become a transformative act to create a new movement of Christianity was the World Wars. World War I awakens European society to, to a lot of reality. To the reality that if we don't figure this out, we're going to kill each other. We have the technology. It also became aware that who was killing each other were fellow Christians, were Presbyterians from Scotland, were Germans from Lutheran, uh, were Lutherans from Germany, were Anglicans from England, were Baptists from Ireland. These were the ones warning each other. If we did not figure it out, we were going to destroy ourselves. That's why by 1930, by 1939, by the eve of World War II, major drastic transformative changes occurred. We wind just a quick second to the Civil War. The Civil War split denominations. The Southern Baptist, the United Methodist Church is only the United Methodist Church since 1939 because in 1861, the North went one way and the South went with silver. It took 78 years. It took 70, it took 74 years after the end of the Civil War, after the end of slavery, for the Methodists, our siblings of the Methodist movement, to bury the hatchet and come back together. By the 1930s, the foundation for our denomination began. The Congregationalists, the descendants, direct descendants of the Massachusetts Bay Colony Separatists, Puritans and the Christian church decided to merge. On the other side, just down the street, not too far away, the German Reformed and the German Evangelical churches of the United States of America also merged to form the Reformed Evangelical Church. Conversations between all four were already happening. Along with the father, there's a wonderful book called Hidden Stories that talks about the wide-ranging, the indigenous, the African-American communities, the plethora of communities that were part of these conversations. And here's where our scripture passage is coming. It all was based on the idea of humility. That we had to be humble to one another. That we had to be able to check what we thought was essential, discovered that a lot of what we considered absolute was actually non-essential. They were roadblocks to unity that is essential. To seek that justice, peace, and love. It takes another 25 years plus after those denominations merge in 1957, post-World War II, post the awful, bloodthirsty, Sequel to World War I. The United Church of Christ is born. The 20th century birthed a movement of ecumenism, a movement of, of seeking to build one another. The key was that patient humility, that willingness to hear these words from Scripture. And just today, you yourself have entered into a space of humility, whether or not you're aware of it. The Book of Sirach is not in your pew Bible. Here again, apparently. At least. 
one of the plethora of things we've been yelling at each other over the last 500 plus years. The reason the book of Sirach is not in your pew Bible is because the only manuscript we have in it is a Greek manuscript, which means I, I'm not going, I don't know how Jewish culture deals with these books. There's a collection of them, quite a few of them. Parts of the Esther, for example. Uh, Psalm 151. Some Psalms, some books have, some Bibles have 150 Psalms, some have 151 Psalms. We have a tradition that these books don't go into our Bible. So what does it mean to engage them? What does it mean to listen to their wisdom? And that's what these are. Both Proverbs and Sirach come from what's known as the ancient wisdom traditions. The ancient ways of describing, just as we would with any other sort of advice giving, these ideas of what it truly means to live the life of God, to live as a faithful servant of the people. Ultimately, the point being, are we humble enough to even the point where we can say that, you know, hey, that's not in the Bible I own, that's not in the Bible that's in my church, but I know it's a Bible of my I know it's in the Bible of my siblings. And so it's a story I'm willing to hear. It's a story that over coffee I'm willing to read. It's a story even in my own worship experience I'm willing to let enter into my soul and guide me deeper into the oh, what is ultimate. What is essential? The service of God. The waiting to hear that call to serve justice, to serve peace, and ultimately to serve the realm of God's eternal life that we have. That's the humility. The, the passages emphasize how important it is, how much greater, how, how much greater it is to wait, to not say that's not my Bible. But instead to say, wait, where did that come from? To be aware, as in Sirach, of, as we already know from the world wars and the divisions we've experienced over centuries, over a thousand plus years, of Sirach's warning of the devastation that comes when we proudly boast we are right. Instead of being humble and saying, wait, is there more I need to hear? In our day and age, it's a very important reality. It's very important to understand why we are the United Church of Christ. It's very important to understand the humility we need to discover what is truly essential to our faith and to our calling, and to grieve and let go and realize the liberty and the beauty of the non-essentials of our faith recognize that ultimately we are called in all things to love one another, moving towards the true essence of the Amen. We say as you are able and by your spirit we sing our closing hymn. O oh, Jesus, I have promised.
May you be blessed when you sit at fine tables of welcome and when you spread the picnic blanket of peace. May you be blessed in giving and receiving, not repaying, but your hearts repaired. Amen. Thank you.